very good morning, ladies and gentlemen. Welcome to the Humanizing Innovation at MMU webinar series. Today, I'm your moderator. I'm Dr. Yvonne Lee from the Faculty of Management. First, let me quickly introduce myself. I'm a digital economist from the Faculty of Management. I research in entrepreneurship as well as the knowledge economy slash digital economy. As on behalf of the organizer, I would like to, to welcome you to this webinar series. Thank you for sparing your time with us. Let us begin. Today's webinar entitled Malaysia, Heart of Digital ASEAN is a very timely one as our nation and the region collectively emerge from the pandemic and adjust to living in this world where the virus is endemic among us. The past 18 months has shown us how the digital economy went from a being just a nice to have um, applicable to certain groups of people to being the very backbone of Malaysia and the economy worldwide and playing an important role in ensuring our well-being in Malaysia as well as in ASEAN. The World Economic Forum notes that ASEAN is the fastest growing internet market in the world and with 125,000 new users coming on to the internet daily, the ASEAN digital economy is projected to grow significantly and add 1 trillion to the regional GDP in the next 10 years. So with that, there are a lot of um, policies that are being drafted at ASEAN level to address any potential roadblocks towards this digital ASEAN. So ever since the inception of the multimedia super corridor in Malaysia, um, Malaysia has not ceased to pursue this digital agenda as well. The Jandela, the Jalinan Digital Negara plan was formulated to provide this wider coverage and better quality of broadband experience while we have My Digital, which is the Malaysian Digital Economy Blueprint. So all of that uh, propels Malaysia into this digital economy, which is the eventual um, target as a high income nation and also a regional leader. And more recently, the 12th Malaysian plan also strives to do that, put Malaysia back on track um, after the effects of the pandemic. It is time for us to consider the prospects of this post-pandemic uh, digital economy in Malaysia and ASEAN. Today, we have two very accomplished speakers on this topic. They are Mr. Sivaniyagam Thalayutham, Director, Industry Development and Marketing at Digital Penang, and MMU's very own Professor Dr. Saravana Muthaya of the Faculty of Management. Before we begin, I would like to welcome all participants, uh, those who are viewing us through our social media platforms. Also, just a little housekeeping before we get started. If you have any questions during the presentation, please type them in into the uh, chat boxes at your respective platform. We will have time for questions after both presentations. To kick off this webinar, our first speaker, Professor Dr. Saravana Mutaya, will be speaking on fintech and value creation in the context of digital transformation. Professor Dr. Saravanian Muthaya is a full professor in Multimedia University, Cyberjaya, where he teaches and conducts research in the area of research predictive analytics, fintech, ontologies, blockchain, cryptocurrencies, semantic web algorithms, and web 4.0. He has served as a director dean of the Graduate School of Management in MMU until March 2018 and the Research Institute for Digital Enterprise. He is a Fulbright Scholar and also a CATS Intel Senior Research Fellow, a research outfit based in Washington, D.C., USA. Dr. Muthaya holds 30 intellectual properties and has won multiple research awards, including ITEX and Pajita. In 2020, he won the International CGMA Academic Champions Research Award on his work in the area of blockchain provenance and trust. He was the first Malaysia uh, citizen to win this award in this category. 
He has published more than 100 articles in top tier journals, index in ISI, Scopus, as well as books, books, chapters, and workshops and conferences. Dr. Mutaya is also a frequent keynote speaker at research summits, conferences, and workshops worldwide. I now welcome Prof. Saravana Mutaya to take over the stage. Prof? Thank you so much, Dr. Yvonne, for that kind uh, introduction. Um, let me just quickly share my um, PowerPoint uh, slides. Um, so today, uh, I'll be talking about the um, in the context of Malaysian heart of digital ASEAN, which is our topic for today, I'll be speaking more on the fintech and value creation aspect of uh, digital ASEAN, particularly in the context of uh, digital transformation. So let's take a step back and look at some facts, right? Uh, the 12 Malaysian uh, plan uh, had actually aimed to position Malaysia as a as the center for digital ASEAN. And uh, there are several major developments of which I'll be talking about four main ones, which is uh, FinTech and uh, definition, as well as the entire ecosystem of, of FinTech. I'll be also touching on digitization, digitalization and uh, digital transformation, which is the second uh, key uh, feature of uh, today's uh, presentation. Uh, I will also be touching a little bit on trust and the trusted third party platforms. Um, some data from Edelman Trust will be presented later on. And uh, lastly, on this unbanked population that uh, is basically driving some of the uh, areas for value creation, particularly in digital banking and where some of non-banking entities are actually coming on very strong in. Um, and in that aspect, I'll be touching a little bit on money transfers, e-wallets, and P2P lending, and some of the trends that are taking place. So let's look at the definition. Uh, FinTech has been actually used in the English uh, language since 1971. It's just become very popular in recent times. And uh, when we talk about fintech, basically we're touching upon the aspect of digitization of financial services. And that includes lending, borrowing, credit, banking, and automated payment system. So a lot of my uh, topic uh, uh, talk today, the topics I'll be touching upon will be on some of these uh, elements. Uh, and for SME banking, there's just a full uh, you know, a uh, huge area that, uh, you know, we'll need more time to dive into, but if time permits, I will touch a little bit on SME banking as well. Um, and of course, um, where you see financial services that are actually being offered through, you know, technological platforms, softwares, and, you know, things that are now very popular, mobile payment apps, cryptocurrencies, they all fall under this category. So let's talk a little bit about the fintech ecosystem, right? So we talk about fintech, fintech covers blockchain. We are talking about digital payments, digital exchange, exchange of uh, digital assets. So a lot of research going on also in the space on things like provenance and blockchain and smart contracts and just a lot of new latest developments in the space. Uh, digital money, of course, uh, looking at, uh, you know, Bitcoin and other cryptocurrencies like Ethereum um, and some of those, uh, you know, platforms and what those platforms are offering. And of course, uh, online banking, uh, most of us would have probably been introduced to online banking in Malaysia way back in, I think, 1997, where Maybank launched the Maybank to You platform. And uh, we've come a long way since 1997. You know, in fact, there were not many homes in Malaysia that had internet access like what we have today. But, uh, you know, internet banking had already kicked off. So you can imagine that, you know, kind of, uh, you know, uh, two different worlds. Uh, one is the connectivity and the other one is actually having services run on connectivity. So services were coming out, connectivity was not as much. 
and uh, moving on we we have investment and uh, also things like crowdfunding so we'll be talking about a little bit of each one of these uh, in my slides today uh, so the first aspect of this is digitization. So when we talk about digitization, um, basically it's the idea of moving from an analog space to a digital space. So what do I mean by analog to digital, right? So you take money, for example, right? Uh, it's always been uh, physical uh, money in this aspect, very physical, uh, you know, uh, uh, relationship with money. We all have a very physical relationship with money. And of course, uh, money as a currency. Uh, if you take that and you start converting that into a digital platform, it becomes e-money. So the very first aspect of moving into a digital space is you need this uh, transition from physical to a digital platform. And that process is called digitization or conversion. So it deals a lot with data and of course, the asset itself, in this case, money. And uh, once we've achieved that, the next phase is to move from the conversion to adaptation. Basically, we're looking at how we can actually create an ecosystem, business, new um, business propositions within this. Okay, so things like AI, things like smart contracts, they all become very important. And that is basically the process of adaptation, so digitalization. So the learning part happens. So once we have all the data, now we can learn from the data. So you can do things like analytics and so on and so forth. That would be basically the second element, right? And uh, moving on from uh, the adaptation process, the, the, the next phase basically is how can we convert this digitalization and digitization is done how can we take the adaptation and conversion and create new business models? And this is what a lot of the, uh, uh, and, you know, the uh, people who are actually involved in this, peer-to-peer uh, -peer networks, peer-to-peer -peer lending, digital crowdfunding, all of these guys are actually uh, working on finding new business models that they can actually thrive on. And that's the digital transformation part. So without digitization and digitalization, you cannot have digital transformation. This is what uh, we'll be talking about throughout today's uh, uh, program. Also, um, if you you know just think about this, uh, previously you know if you wanted to borrow money or you wanted to use any form of uh, you know services that are banking related, it has to go back to the banks, right? So the banks were the only place where you can actually, you know, borrow money from, take a loan, uh, apply, you know, apply for some sort of a lending facility, credit facility, it's always the bank. Now, with lots of deregulation and digitization, as well as digitalization coming into play, now you have more players who are non-banks who are actually coming forward to offer uh, services, financial services in their space. Now, one good example is to take a look at this list, this was actually issued by Bank Negara Malaysia. And today, today, if you're looking at about 47 non-bank e-money issuers in the country, and that includes some big names like Infinite, Alipay, uh, Boost, Touch and Go. And, you know, you can basically look at all the, the, the big, big uh, names here listed here. And the first four that I like to touch on is Aon Credit, uh, they have been um, very early uh, people who actually come on board to actually offer e-money, e e-transfers. And then you have Alipay, which basically owns uh, Lazada. So uh, everyone's familiar with Lazada and uh, online shopping. Lazada you know, is becoming something that's uh, very common in our lives today. So Alipay is, is, is a big part of that platform. And then you have Aziatas, Boost. It's also one of the big e-wallets in the country. And Banda Utama also has its very own called One Card. Uh, and if you look uh, very closely at this list, you will see Touch and Go appearing in two places. It's listed as Touch and Go Digital Remittance in Jambarhat, and also Touch and Go in Jambarhat, which is then linked to the uh, e-wallet systems uh, that some of us use in our uh, for paying our toll and of course for micro payments over the counter. And uh, from 47 non-bank entities, uh, you can also look at the chart 
here that I've listed six banks that are also involved in this space. So now you have number of players uh, to kind of supplement what was not available in the past. Uh, going back to Edelman and class, one of the key uh, problems that we find in the space of finance or financial services is that um, most people do not trust um, the financial services as much as they do trust uh, some of the other industries. So if you're talking about technology, if you look at this, you know, you're hitting about 80% here. And uh, technology is somehow trusted. You know, there's a lot of trust in technology. Then uh, you see automotive and then energy and some others. But financial services have always been on the low side. And this is a report from Edelman Trust Barometer, which I just like to share. So when financial services kind of merges with technology, all of a sudden, you know, there is a trust, trust element that we have to actually work very hard to, uh, you know, enforce. And this is when we talk about things like provenance, uh, self-auditing systems, blockchain, and the whole, uh, you know, ecosystem comes about, you know. Uh, and this is one area which is uh, kind of emerging, developing, and a lot more use cases needed uh, to, to, to actually roll up services in this space. Um, so one very interesting area where, there, where it requires a lot more attention is uh, the area of money transfer. And, there, and, and when you talk about trust and money transfer, you know, we know a lot of Ponzi schemes out there. We know a lot of dangerous uh, dark web related, uh, you know, um, entities out there just taking your money. So we want to actually uh, be able to kind of keep it safe at the same time, address this need where, you know, lots of people in the world do not have a bank account. And uh, there is a need for them to, you know, save money, uh, transfer money, provide, you know, transactions, uh, have systems that can actually reduce the middleman. And, and reduce things like commissions related to transactions. So to just kind of give a, a, you know, an overview of this, there are about 2 billion people in this world, almost one third of the world today is, are people who do not have a bank account. And 55% of them are women, 54% of them are from the poorest nations, 40% uh, of their households are belong to developing countries, and 54% are young adults. So these are the the, the target groups and let's look at see let's see how this is actually changing in terms of ASEAN um, population with bank account and you're talking about only 27 percent in ASEAN who actually own a bank account have a bank account and if you break down to countries the, you know the, the you know the, the larger countries in ASEAN you're talking about Indonesia uh, 49 percent of Indonesia almost half and half 49 percent uh, have a bank account, 51% do not have a bank account. And then you have the Philippines and Vietnam. So how do we just get these people digitally connected to borrowing and lending and some of the banking services, what we want to talk about. And according to Deloitte, right, when they were asked on whether they were willing to use financial technological products, uh, in ASEAN, 82% of them said yes. And uh, in some of the other countries, you can see they are responding very positively to this. So there is sort of a trust element that is already beginning to uh, come up in this space. Uh, Indonesia, 48.9% of the population had a bank account, but uh, have a bank account, but uh, um, some of them lost trust in the bank, uh, banking system per se, which is the problem that I talked about earlier. But 54.8% of them want to borrow money. So you don't have an account, but you want to borrow money, and that seems to be the issue here. Uh, again, Philippines, 34.5% have a bank account, but 58% want to actually borrow money. And in the ASEAN Fintech Census 2018, uh, it talks about, you know, the report talks about expanding economies, young, urban, digitally savvy population, uh, where you have increasing mobile. So, so even if you do not have internet as such, now you have uh, mobile connectivity using your smartphone and more, more and more people are actually getting on board uh, the network with your smartphone. You can actually do those banking uh, uh, transactions with your phone. So problem number one is commissions. This is one of the biggest issues. 
for every dollar that you you transmit 25% goes into transaction fee this is one area of inefficiency that you want to get rid of now these are some of the major players in the industry who actually move money right so now you can see why you know the non bank uh, entities are becoming important like uh, what we talked about in boost and you know touch and go and some of the other e wallets in the nation because these guys charge uh, a huge amount of money in terms of commissions so a typical example would be paypal charges something like 125 uh, dollars for every 500 dollar uh, remitted and that's uh, approximately 25% so problem number 2 is um, multiple middlemen so you have moving money from one uh, entity to another you not only have to deal with the commissions but now you have to deal with number of intermediaries. So there's too many middlemen in the equation. And that's something else that you want to uh, tackle. So in the, in the entirety of, of what we're talking about, this is by FinTech Singapore on FinTech News. And uh, you see that some of the key use cases for FinTech in Malaysia, particularly even in ASEAN, are things like remittance, payments, crowdfunding, lending, uh, currency exchange, and uh, we are looking at also things like, you know, technological uh, aspects of it, which is the blockchain and uh, AI and, and things like a uh, marketplace and also insurance, um, which is something that's happening now. So a lot of underwriting processes are also going to take advantage of the blockchain now and uh, coupled with, uh, you know, smart contracts. So a quick, quick snapshot of COVID, pre and post COVID, right? You can see source here, I'm quoting from Digital Life uh, and uh, some of our, uh, uh, you know, some of these uh, uh, e-payment uh, platforms or e-wallet platforms have become more popular now. But as of uh, 2019 quarter three, and this like, you know, just happened, right? you know, the, the, the uh, COVID situation, you can see more and more people are actually going online, more and more people are actually purchasing online, they're doing a lot of procurement online, they're not, they're not really physically going to, you know, uh, banks anymore. Uh, people prefer to use uh, e-wallets and the adoption of e-wallets have also increased. Uh, if you look at quarter four, 2017, Boost was basically the number one uh, app uh, and, uh, you know, towards the, uh, the, the COVID, the pandemic, and you can see, uh, you know, after the pandemic, Grab has kind of taken up the spot, the first spot. And, and today, one out of five people who use these e-wallets are actually using GrabPay. Um, and for the second uh, top uh, performer before the COVID was safe, and now you can see Touch and Wallet has kind of taken the second spot. Boost has dropped to third spot. Alipay was kind of strong, kind of quiet, and it's kind of like not moving anywhere right now. Um, and uh, these are the basically the, the, the you know the final uh, listings that you can see as Faith has dropped down to number five, Big Pay has dropped down to in you know, number four, and you have Grab taking the first spot. Um, Touch and Go's e-wallet uh, currently has about five million users, over hundred thousand merchants who are registered. Asiata's Boost has currently about 4.8 million users for 115,000 merchants. And uh, you can see this gaining traction as we, uh, as we, as we go along this you know, post-pandemic. Uh, uh, um, overall, in uh, ASEAN and in, uh, in around the world, uh, there are about uh, several Key areas which you see a lot of new developments taking place. You see a lot of uh, digital transformation taking place in finance, uh, credit score analytics, uh, compliance and regulatory process, payment processing networks, crypto, uh, digital banking, mobile wallets. So this is basically a, kind of a landscape of what's really happening around the world. Um, and uh, in Malaysia, particularly in ASEAN, you can see that uh, the payment processing networks are actually growing, uh, you know, very, very rapidly. And there's also a lending aspect to it, which will be, you know, uh, discussed later, more on the P2P aspect of it, it's also becoming very important. So 
a lot of people who cannot get uh, uh, you know money finances from the banks now traditional financing it's kind of difficult and you know you have a lot of new rules for this right um, so where do they go and get this money from particularly SMEs who are looking for expanding their businesses um, they are actually in need for finances where do they actually look for their money and that's one area where P2P lending is actually trying to solve uh, the fintech ecosystem in the, the other parts of the world, if uh, we're talking about China, US, Japan, you can see again, payment is number one, financing, then comes savings and some other uh, areas. And uh, in the past, Visa, right? Visa, uh, EMV, uh, uh, Europe MasterCard and Visa used to be the big names. Now they're being taken over by all the other uh, players or non-bank players, and you can see that development uh, across not only ASEAN but also the rest of the world. Uh, in achieving uh, universal financial access by 2020, this study talks about some of the nations that we actually touched on earlier. But if you can see here, Philippines, uh, I'm just going to pick Myanmar, Philippines, some of the ASEAN countries, you see that the, the penetration of uh, uh, people having access to banks, uh, banking facilities, uh, owning a bank account, has become, uh, you know, uh, uh, something that uh, we need to worry about now. So how do we actually get them to be onboarded? And that onboarding process is where these non-banking players become very important. China and India put together actually make up 32% of the 2 billion population who do not have access to financial services. Key statistics that I like to share for SMEs, particularly SMEs looking for financial, uh, you know, funding and uh, uh, what we call peer-to-peer -peer lending platforms. Uh, so far in Malaysia, 8,102 successful campaigns have been actually rolled out. About 632.38 million uh, ringgit has already been raised, and there have been about 1,866 uh, successful issuers under the P2P financing platform. And uh, this is taken from crowdfunding statistics as of 31st December 2019. And if you want to know who are these big names in P2P lending, uh, they are listed here. I've got about nine here. Uh, and uh, the default rate that they charge, minimum investment and fees uh, are all listed here for your viewing. And uh, Going on to the final part of my presentation, the main really core of the, the technology is basically we're trying to solve three things. I talked about digitization, digitalization, and digital transformation. But to kind of give you a perspective of this, the first part, uh, basically we are actually using technologies such as blockchain, where we can actually take records and you know convert them and you know provide the, the trust element using a feature uh, of immutability within the uh, transaction. So digitization with immutable records is basically one key value that is being proposed uh, as part of this ecosystem. The second part of the value proposition here is where we can actually get all these people who have no bank accounts, who do not have any access to gain access to exchange digital assets, to exchange uh, uh, money, to transfer money. And once they are already onboarded through the digitization program, now we can have all these different services, which is part of the digitalization process. Okay, And new products can actually be offered to them. And one, new, one such new product will be, you know, you know, buy now and pay later, right? It's a very interesting uh, aspect. You can actually own something now and then have uh, payment done later on, which is something that never been heard of. And a lot of these uh, 47 or so uh, uh, players that I mentioned earlier are actually already doing this. And the last part is where we can actually have exchange of uh, value as well as assets using what we call a smart contract. And that is basically the digital transformation where new business models are actually being created. So um, in short, in short, some of the upcoming trends would be, you know, moving towards uh, storing digital records, exchanging of digital assets, and leveraging from uh, smart contracts. So this is, in a nutshell, to summarize um, what I wanted to share for today. Uh, 
And uh, that's uh, all from, from me. And uh, over to you, uh, Dr. Yvonne. Thank you. Thank you very much, Professor Saravanan, for the most insightful talk on fintech. It has much to offer in light of this increased online behavior that we have seen the move towards online platforms by the consumers, especially, but also by the financial and non-financial institutions alike, as we've seen. But there are also those issues that are potential roadblocks. Uh, but let's move forward. For those who have joined us, let's uh, welcome to the latest edition of Humanizing Innovation at MMU webinar series. We have just heard from Professor Dr. Saravanan on fintech and the value creation in the context of digital transformation. Just a reminder, please be sure to type in your questions into the chat boxes at your respective social media that you are getting this live feed. Um, less than four nights ago, the 20th ASEAN Economic Community AEC Council meeting convened in Bandar Seri Begawan, Brunei Darussalam, and discussed the transformation digital agenda in the region. The meeting emphasized that preparing for the digital transformation is essential to sustain ASEAN's economic growth, as well as to bolster ASEAN regional integration. To further elaborate um, on digital ASEAN, and its prospects. I would like to invite our second panelist, Mr. Siwene Yagam Belayutam, to talk about how the future of digital is ASEAN and how Malaysia is well positioned to be the heart of digital ASEAN. Thank you. Thank you, Dr. Yvonne. Uh, uh, and uh, thank you also, uh, 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 my fellow panelists, Professor Dr. Sarvanan, for a very insightful uh, uh, sharing on FinTech. Uh, good morning, everyone. Uh, 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 I'm delighted to be part of this uh, Harmonizing Innovation at MMU webinar series. The uh, topic, uh, Malaysia, Heart of Digital ASEAN, is something uh, very close to my heart. Uh, I used to uh, be, uh, most of my career life, I used to be with MDEC and, um, and now back at my home state in Penang to look into how can I uh, develop the digital uh, ecosystem, digital economy back home in Penang. And, uh, and um, I truly believe that, uh, that uh, Malaysia is very well positioned to be the digital app of ASEAN based on our unique uh, value pro propositions. Uh, next slide, please. Okay, so here in this slide, we have a lot of these stats in, uh, and most of these stats are, 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 are basically the pre-COVID uh, st stats. As uh, uh, Professor Saravanan has highlighted, FinTech has grown in a very, very big way. So the latest uh, 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 article that I read a couple of days back is that one of the FinTech company, even in, a, in a, uh, Germany, N26, has has taken, uh, has become bigger than the second largest bank in, in, uh, in Germany. So uh, uh, fin with FinTech growing and, and, um, and the entire digital economy is growing, so uh, uh, what do you call that? Digital is the next way to uh, uh, forward. And Malaysia uh, uh, having a good head start in terms of uh, fintech, as you, as you could see this slide, in terms of um, uh, the adoption of uh, uh, broadband, in terms of the adoption of uh, uh, what do you call that? Uh, mobile uh, phone penetration and all those is quite high in Malaysia. And uh, it's a very normal thing in Malaysia for uh, people to use online banking. Okay, that's number one. Number two is that uh, social media is very pervasive. It's uh, uh, in Malaysia, you know, there, there's uh, Malaysians uh, in terms of social media, in terms of Facebook and all the stuff, uh, but Malaysia has more friends than the global average. Uh, there was a joke saying that uh, in Malaysia uh, and social media before, when they wake up, before talking to their partners, they will, first thing they will do is that start checking on their social media and stuff. And in terms of uh, 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 digital uh, disrupting our normal life, like example, there's a lot of B2C apps like like the most common one nowadays is my Sajatra. Without my Sajatra, you can't enter most of the places. So my my Sajatra has changed the way how we use digital. We have food pandas, Grab, and all the stuff. And um, it's not only disrupting the uh, uh, the consumers, even for the businesses. Like like uh, was shared earlier, Alibaba or the lorry. If you want to uh, a business wants to send a good, in the past they have to have their own uh, 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 transport, right? Now, moving forward, you just need to go to an app, look into uh, apps like the lorry and all the stuff, 
and arrange your, your transportation. And uh, in terms of why Malaysia has always been one of the leading locations uh, in Southeast Asia, is number one, we have the diversity. So uh, during the uh, uh, early days of you know, a lot of these global uh, uh, tech companies, example, facial recognition. If, if it's a, a, a facial recognition from China, they, they have the Chinese population there. And when they want to grow outside China, one of the first locations they normally choose is Malaysia because of that diversity, right? You can, you can test it out with different uh, uh, types of uh, different races and stuff. And then second thing is that Malaysia has a very good urban uh, rural divide. So uh, for, a, for an app to work well, it, you know, example, places like Hong Kong or China or even Singapore, it's very much urbanized. But if you want to take it out to the region like Indonesia or, or, or India, or Philippines and all the stuff, you need a location to test the uh, both in the urban and also rural side, right? So Malaysia is one of those good sites. Third thing is internet connectivity. We have uh, one of the best internet connectivity in ASEAN, and you can also uh, test it out in, in, in locations, uh, both in the city side and also the urban uh, rural sites. There's a lot of government support incentives in terms of talent, in terms of tax incentive and all those to attract uh, digital companies to look at Malaysia. And uh, lastly, uh, uh, based on all these tests, we have a very high uh, digital adoption rate, right? So example, some of these companies who have used Malaysia as a testing location or to start their, their operations is like example, Soka. Um, I, I'm sure a lot of us have used Soka. For Soka under the SK uh, Mobility Group, they, the first location they started Soka was Malaysia and it became a big success. And now they have started rolling out to the rest, uh, rest of ASEAN. Okay. And uh, a recent report uh, uh, also indicates that Malaysia is the largest e-commerce market in ASEAN. Even though we are a small uh, uh, country compared in terms of population compared to Vietnam or Indonesia and all the stuff, but we are at the moment the largest uh, e-commerce market because of the high adoption of digital among the population. Okay, next slide, please. So, so in the past, uh, 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 of course, Malaysia has, has done quite well in terms of attracting uh, global investments into Malaysia. There's three types of major investments uh, which have set up in Malaysia. Number one is the GBS or Global Business Services. Malaysia has been ranked last 16 years as the third best GBS location. So if you look into all the pharma company, most of the pharma company have their, the global, the top global ones have their uh, back end shared services in Malaysia. If you look into uh, oil and gas or the banking uh, and telcos and stuff, right? So, so we have a, a very matured uh, shared services location uh, in the country and, uh, and, um, and the government is uh, uh, keep on promoting Malaysia as, as a shared services location for the region. The second biggest investment is, of course, tech investment, like the likes of, uh, you know, uh, SOCAS uh, Development and Support Center, uh, Food Panda, a lot of these uh, uh, new tech companies or internet companies have also started using Malaysia as a development center. And the third one is uh, the creative uh, economy, whether it's a visual effects uh, 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 development center, uh, games development, animation development. So these are the types of companies that have set up in Malaysia. And um, total investment that Malaysia has attracted over the last 25 years in terms of digital is almost 100, million, 100 billion USD. And, uh, and uh, it has attracted almost uh, uh, 2,800 plus companies uh, MSC Malaysia uh, overall has about 200,000 uh, jobs uh, and uh, unofficially the digital industry in Malaysia is uh, employing about half a, half a million people. Okay, MMU being, uh, of course, MMU being in Cyber Jaya, uh, one of the main campus, you could see a lot of uh, shared services have come into Cyber Jaya in the past, but nowadays uh, uh, companies have also started moving more and more towards the city side, especially Bangsa South, the Mid Valley side and all those. Okay, and uh, one of the key trends of these companies is, of course, uh, Malaysia is uh, labor market is becoming very expensive compared to, compared to the region. So a lot of the shared services in Malaysia have started moving up the value chain. More higher value stuffs are being done in Malaysia. A lot of uh, RPAs and new automation tools are being used. And um, and uh, what's good about the shared services is that. Uh, the global companies have started uh, realizing that the backend operation 
is very important because you are able to use the back end to control all the uh, your operations globally. And a lot of Malaysians who started working in these shared services centers have started moving upwards uh, towards their global uh, locations, right? So there's a very good uh, opportunity for Malaysians to move up the value chain. This is in line to the uh, uh, government's aspiration to move Malaysia to a knowledge-based economy. Uh, next slide, please. Okay, so there's various uh, government agencies in the digital space uh, uh, and also in terms of making Malaysia as the heart of digital ASEAN, the two key major agencies uh, that is playing a, a big role here is MIDA and MDEC. Uh, even this year, they have launched the Digital uh, Investment Office to coordinate all uh, digital investments in the country. And um, uh, as you can see, there's various kind of ecosystem to support uh, uh, investments or position Malaysia as the preferred investment destination. There is the uh, tax incentive either from MTEC, we have the MSC state, uh, status uh, incentive, uh, there's MIDA incentives. In terms of policies, policies is very important. Uh, even two days back, one of the global investors was saying that Vietnam is a good manufacturing location, but when it comes to IP, Malaysia is a better location. So we have very good IP protection law. We have policies in terms of cyber security, data laws and stuff. Uh, in terms of uh, grants, the, the government has various kind of grants, whether it's digital, digitalization grants for technology companies, for scale up companies, there's a lot of uh, grants and, and also funding available for startup ecosystem. There's also grants uh, to attract, uh, to, to get more MNCs to work with the uh, technology companies in Malaysia. In terms of the ecosystem, ecosystem is something very important. As you can see, a lot of these uh, uh, global companies have started uh, doing a corporate innovation program. They don't want to, you know, doing research in-house is becoming very expensive. So they started uh, working with the ecosystem, especially the startups, right? So Malaysia has a good uh, startup ecosystem. We have, uh, of course, government agencies like Magic there. We have a lot of accelerators, incubators, uh, co-working spaces, uh, and all those and then uh, uh, the other very important component which MMU is also in the play is the uh, talent, right? Talent talent is a very important component. We have the fresh talent or the pipeline of talent uh, for the industries, the digital industry especially. So that's very important. So uh, 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 MMU being a, a premier digital tech universities, we also have a couple of other premier digital tech universities. These are the talents which will be supplied to the uh, uh, digital investors that are coming into Malaysia. We are also looking into how can we have more finishing schools, right? That's the second important thing. Third thing is that how can there be more uh, collaboration between the uh, uh, industry and academia? And um, and also uh, now nowadays we are also having a lot of these funds for, for uh, upskilling of talent as well as people who have lost their job. How can we help them to upskill and, and place them back into the uh, workforce, okay? And, and the last thing uh, on this ecosystem, which is very important, is for a global company to support uh, uh, global clients, they also need foreign talents, right? So there's uh, two major things that uh, uh, MDAC does here. One is that they have the uh, expat center, which looks into all the uh, visa processing for foreign talents for large companies, like the likes of Standard Chartered, the HPs, and, and all the other uh, uh, the GBS or tech companies. That's number one. Number two, uh, the country is also um, started expect, uh, uh, attracting startup founders to use Malaysia as their uh, as they have relocate their startups to Malaysia. So we have the MTAP visa, uh, and MTAP visa is used to uh, uh, attract these global uh, companies to start uh, global startups to start looking Malaysia as their as their new location, right? Redomicile their operations to Malaysia. Next slide, please. So uh, one of the uh, priorities, uh, uh, last 25 years is good, but of course, a lot of the uh, neighboring countries have also started uh, catching up, right? So one of the things that uh, the government is looking at is, is how can we uh, keep up the momentum? How can we keep up the lead? How can uh, Malaysia still be one of the major uh, digital location uh, moving forward? So uh, the government has launched the uh, uh, My Digital. Uh, uh, and uh, my digital is basically the main th thing about my digital is that how can we, Malaysia is turned into a digital driven uh, uh, country, uh, high income uh, nation, 
And, 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 and thirdly is that how can we still position Malaysia as a regional uh, uh, digital economy, right? This is very important because uh, uh, what do you call that? If we don't move to digital, we cannot, Malaysia cannot play in the same game uh, as before. Okay, we are not a big market. You know, countries like, example, Indonesia and Vietnam, they are big market. Indonesia is almost 240, 250 million people. Vietnam, 100 over million people. So they can offer the, the cheap labors and all those stuff. Malaysia cannot be in that space. We are not, uh, we cannot be doing a capital play like Singapore. Singapore plays capital, uh, uh, big in capital play. What they do is that they go and invest in companies and bring them to have their HQs in, in Singapore. What Malaysia could do is that how can we automate uh, most of the uh, uh, industries in Malaysia so that they can uh, survive this digital era? That's number one. How can we have more uh, automated factories in, in Malaysia? Meaning that the factories uh, in Malaysia will be uh, uh, fully automated with robots and all those Malaysians uh, are upskilled to manage those robots, right? That's that's the vision of the country. And, um, and, uh, uh, and the thing is that there are some uh, major uh, KPIs under uh, my digital, uh, especially in terms of digitalization of government, looking into upskilling of talent in terms of infrastructure, how can we upskill uh, uh, more Malaysians? And last, lastly, how can the Ragyat in general benefit through all these uh, initiatives by the government? So uh, through my digital, at the moment, uh, the country's uh, digital economy is contributing roughly about 20% of the GDP. By 2025, the target is uh, uh, about 22.6% of the uh, GDP should be from digital economy. And uh, if you could see the slides, uh, there are the six uh, strategic uh, trusts of my digital. Next slide, please. Of course, uh, uh, these are the uh, some of the uh, key outcomes of uh, uh, my digital. And uh, and um, as you know, uh, 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 what do you call that? Uh, my digital is going to play a, a, a big role in terms of uh, taking Malaysia into this uh, digital world. Uh, some of the things that I want to highlight here is that uh, in terms of digital economies, number one, uh, the country is expecting about 70 billion uh, new digital investment into the country. How can we bring, uh, bring this 70 billion? What are those uh, technology areas that we want to focus on? And uh, of course, at MDEC side, uh, uh, the agency which is looking into digital investment, uh, they are looking into some of the uh, major uh, tech areas, like example, uh, as Prof. Sarah highlighted, one is fintech. We are looking into more attracting more AI companies to come out and based out of Malaysia. How can we grow the uh, cyber security uh, 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 ecosystem? Either tech companies setting up their, their uh, cyber security presence here in Malaysia or global GBS companies bringing in more cyber security ecosystems into Malaysia. How can we attract more uh, hyperscale data centers into Malaysia? Right, The, uh, the government is uh, discussing with a couple of these big global uh, tech companies to move some of their global data centers uh, into Malaysia. And of course, the other uh, technology areas, like example, uh, robotics, drone, and all those uh, are also some of the focus areas. And uh, I would like to uh, share uh, some of the things that, uh, that uh, especially uh, drone, if you if you ask me, drone has changed. Uh, earlier, it was just a, uh, what do you call that, flying object. It has changed to become a robot. So drones uh, with AI and all those, it could, do a lot of things. Example, a drone which is used by the uh, uh, what do you call that fire department can detect uh, uh, fire and also uh, uh, not only that can be used for, for saving lives and all kind of things. So it's becoming a robot, right? So um, and um, uh, some of the cases that we have started seeing even in uh, Penang is uh, example drones are being used by Penang Port to not only for surveillance but also for inspection of port. Uh, facilities, whether it's the crane and all the stuff. And moving forward, they are also not only looking at aerial drones, but also underwater drones, right? So the country is also looking into 5,000 startups, uh, looking into uh, the uh, uh, having the entire country uh, fiberized, uh, more 5G, uh, 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 how to say, uh, adoption, and also uh, uh, digital labs and all those in the country. Next slide, please. Okay. So, so when you talk about digitalization in the past, most of the uh, digital economy, digitalization, the startups and all those were very much uh, located in the uh, 
Klang Valley area. Uh, and one of the priority of the government now is that how can we move this this uh, 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 how to say this entire uh, digital economy towards the all, all the other parts of the country? Like example in northern uh, 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 state like Penang and Kedah, how can Penang focus on certain things like Industry 4.0 and stuff? How can Cyber Jaya uh, look more into drone setup and and um, and also uh, have certain uh, 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 digital research centers and stuff. How can Johor be positioned as a drone robotic uh, sandbox? Okay, and then we are also looking into uh, agri-tech. Uh, Sabah Sarawak should be also looking into uh, uh, more into smart cities, oil and gas uh, technology, tourism tech. These are the things that the, the uh, uh, planning which is happening at the uh, uh, federal level how can we move more digital uh, companies, whether it's investment, whether it's startup, whether it's a local uh, startup ecosystem or local tech ecosystem, uh, moving them towards the states. Okay, that's one of the main, main priorities of the country. Uh, next step, uh, next, uh, next slide, please. Sorry, uh, yeah. Okay, so, so uh, talking about moving uh, digital to the regions, uh, of course, uh, uh, me being from uh, Digital Penang, we are looking into how can we move uh, Penang also. If you look into Penang's economy, Penang is the second smallest uh, state in the country, but one of the uh, state, uh, state with the highest uh, uh, per capita income. And uh, if you look into the map, Penang has uh, uh, 10 major uh, industrial locations. So Penang, uh, in the past, it has two major engines. The first engine is, of course, uh, the ENE sector, the semiconductor, Penang contributes about 8% of the global semiconductor, right? And the other engine is uh, tourism and also uh, tourism services related uh, economy. And uh, with the COVID, the tourism was badly hit. So the country, the state is looking at how can we develop the, uh, the next uh, industry? And digital is something that we are focusing on. How can we get, uh, how can we build up the digital ecosystem in Penang, whether it's the infrastructure, whether it's the uh, talent pool, whether it's the other supporting ecosystem, and also attracting more uh, uh, startups and also uh, digital investments into Pinet. The next slide, please. And, um, and um, as I shared earlier, uh, Penang is very well known for the semiconductor industry, and these are the base of Penang. So we have, uh, uh, as I said, we, we, we contribute about 8% of the global sem semiconductor. We have most of the medical devices companies, uh, global medical devices companies have their presence in Penang, right? A lot of them are doing uh, their automation and stuff in Penang, right? And uh, a lot of these companies like the Intels and all those have started hiring a lot of AI engineers and stuff. And then if you look outside the box, we have the local companies. We have about 3,000 plus local uh, uh, e, &E uh, 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 companies. And if you look into Brusa, Malaysia, out of the 11 largest uh, tech companies, seven of them are from Penang. And a lot of these uh, tech companies, they are the anchor uh, or the uh, backbone of Penang. And they have started getting into uh, building their own incubators to grow the startup ecosystem in Penang. So if you are if you are planning to get into the IoT space, if you are looking into planning into getting into the uh, uh, variable space, Penang is the best location for you to come uh, to Penang and uh, and uh, test out your idea, right? The next, and, and of course, apart from the uh, local uh, e, &E uh, companies, we also have a couple of uh, big uh, uh, startups which have started from Penang, like example, Job Street is one, uh, which was sold for 1.7 billion USD. We have uh, companies like Exa by PictoChart is the other one, which are the non e, &E companies. Next slide, please. So, so, uh, 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 the state realized that uh, yes, Penang, Penang's uh, industry is strong because of the E, &E uh, sector. E, &E sector is also expected to grow uh, in the next two years, another uh, to grow another thirty percent. That's a very big, uh, good story, and and we are also expecting more billionaires to come up from this space. But Penang also need to look into the uh, the next industry, and and digital is one of the the major things. Uh, which makes the, the state part of the Penang's uh, vision 2030 to look into how can we focus more into the digital uh, space? How can we uh, have a, a state agency dedicated to look into the growth of digital, uh, uh, not only as an industry, uh, overall uh, digital growth in Penang. So that's when 
uh, Digital Penang was uh, formed last year, April. So it's a fairly new agency. So the four charters of Digital Penang is number one, uh, we, we, we play the role something like a manku in the federal side. How can we uh, advise the government in terms, of, uh, uh, in terms of digital delivery? That's number one. Number two, the state is looking in a big way. How can we have uh, uh, smart cities, whether it's in Georgetown, in Bayan Baru, in Batuat, and also Batukawan? These are the four major areas that has been uh, uh, looked at. How can we have? Uh, how can we make these uh, cities as smart cities, right? How can we have a centralized uh, data hubs and all the stuff? So these are the ongoing uh, discussions at the state level. How can we make Penang as a smart Penang, right? And that's where uh, Digital Penang uh, is playing a major role in terms of working with the state government. The second charter is, of course, digital economy. Digital economy, a couple of major important things is that uh, uh, Penang as an industrial uh, uh, state, right? There's a lot of industries, but still the digital adoption in the industries is still, I, I would not say, uh, at, at the, at the uh, what do you call it, satisfactory level. How can we get more uh, SMEs in Penang to adopt digital? The, the thing is this, if they don't adopt digital, if they don't uh, in, you know, use digital tools, they might be wiped out, right? Because every other uh, uh, company out there, global companies, they are using digital to increase their, their market presence, using digital to reduce their, their costs, increase, uh, using digital to increase their productivity and stuff. So digitalization is a big uh, agenda and we are working with the tech companies, whether it's, it's from Penang or from the uh, uh, global companies to look into how can they help us to digitalize the industries in Penang. Whether uh, I could say industries could be like the medical uh, uh, industry, Penang is well, very well known for medical tourism. How can we uh, digitalize that industry? Number two, uh, uh, tourism. Tourism uh, has been uh, badly impacted. How can we uh, uh, get the tourism in the industry to be back up? But how can they be using uh, digital in a big way, right? And then, of course, the manufacturing and logistics and stuff. The second uh, thing that we are we are focusing on is the startup ecosystem. How can we uh, grow the startup ecosystem uh, uh, in a bigger scale in Penang? At the moment, uh, we have some su very good success uh, stories, but how can we make it, uh, how to say, uh, uh, as big as Kalang Valley, if not possible, but at least second to Kalang Valley? So that's that's the, the big uh, uh, game plan that we have. The third one is, of course, uh, attracting more digital investments into Penang. How can Penang be the development uh, hub for the northern region? Right, we have uh, traditionally uh, the, the big organizations in Penang, like the Intels and Dells, have uh, some di digital uh, uh, development job out, uh, done out of Penang. But how can we grow more digital companies into Penang? Right, and also the lastly, we are also looking into ad adjacent sectors like space tech and other stuff. The, the the next charter of digital Penang is uh, of course the Rakyat portion. How can we get the uh, uh, the hawkers in Penang to adopt uh, digital? How can we uh, get the uh, the uh, elderly population of Penang to look into uh, uh, using online banking, using e-commerce and stuff, right? And the last uh, charter is, of course, uh, advising the government in terms of infrastructure, right? A couple of uh, gaps that Penang has is, number one, we don't have any uh, tier three data center in Penang. So how are we uh, going to uh, work with uh, both state and federal agencies to bring uh, data centers into Penang, that's number one. Number two, we are working in terms of bringing, uh, having Penang's uh, first internet exchange. How can we, uh, uh, 5G is going to come into Malaysia in a big way. How can uh, Penang be one of the uh, first uh, user adopter of 5G? So these are some of the uh, major charters of digital Penang and we look forward into uh, collaborating with the industries, uh, with the universities, with the digital ecosystems to help us to build the digital ecosystem. Uh, uh, ecosystem in Penang. Next slide, please. And uh, and uh, one of the uh, things that uh, we are working on, uh, if you look into it at Malaysia overall, we have uh, digital cities like Cyber Jaya is one, and then now we have Iskandar. So in Penang, we have uh, dedicated the heritage location is a brownfield as the uh, Georgetown uh, Digital District or City Square Georgetown. Uh, what we have done so far successfully is that, uh, uh, example, Draper uh, Startup House, one of the world's renowned uh, startup ecosystem, have set up uh, their presence in Penang. So they are going to launch uh, uh, 
uh, this uh, ecosystem soon uh, by end of the year. This is the first in Malaysia and 15th globally, right? Uh, second thing is that we are working with federal agencies like the MDEC and, and, and Magic, uh, uh, Mosti and stuff to, to, you know, to make Georgetown as the sandbox for smart city and also for tourism, meaning that any local companies, local startups who want to participate in the sandbox, they will be uh, given grants from the uh, Mosti side, right, from 250000 up to $5 million. And we are also building the uh, ecosystem, like example, talent site on the... Uh, uh, we are working with universities in Penang, like Ta, Ta UC, uh, Wawasan, USM. We welcome uh, MMU also. How can we work closely in terms of uh, building the future talents of Penang? In terms of upskilling, we are uh, uh, bringing in some of the finishing schools into Penang to look into, uh, uh, example, AI talent center of excellence and stuff. Uh, thirdly, we are also bringing in all the other ecosystems, whether it's the co-working spaces, incubators, accelerators into Georgetown to make it a, you know, we are going to transform uh, Georgetown uh, where, where uh, uh, what do you call that, in the past, it's always been a tourist location, uh, heritage buildings, how can uh, digital companies now occupy those locations, right? So we are also uh, started talking to a lot of global companies to have their digital development center in this location. Next slide, please. And uh, a bit on the uh, startups, uh, as I said, Penang has a uh, quite good startups. Uh, uh, one, some of the success, uh, earlier success, of course, uh, Job Street, 1.7 billion uh, uh, when they exited. Okay, and uh, and uh, uh, some of the uh, known names, of course, like Picto Charts and Exabyte. But uh, even one month ago, uh, uh, Delivery was acquired by Air Asia. Uh, for almost 8 million uh, USD or 40 million ringgit plus. So there's a lot of uh, uh, interesting startups which are in Penang and uh, we, we hope to work with the, uh, what do you call that, the entire ecosystem uh, to create more startups. So if MMU have programs like entrepreneurship programs and stuff, those are the things that uh, Digital Penang can work very closely in terms of incubating them, uh, looking into uh, uh, them working on problem statements, whether in the areas of smart city, tourism, in the IoT space and stuff, right? And uh, the next slide, please. So uh, in terms of uh, startup, we have the entire uh, ecosystem mapped out. We are working with various uh, ecosystems starting from the universities. So Digital Penang has uh, started engaging the universities in Penang Try, uh, you know, connect, uh, you know, sharing with them why should the uh, students look into entrepreneurship, getting startup founders to go and talk to these uh, universities uh, to look into entrepreneurship in a big way. And then the second thing is that we are connecting them with the uh, startup, uh, taking them through the startup journey. We have uh, some of the uh, incubators, like we work with 1337 and all those stuff. How can we give some initial uh, funds for them to start their startup journey? Right. So that's also uh, ongoing. We have the Reka Nami uh, uh, platform where we get uh, startups to work on industry problems. Uh, we have platform where we get uh, industries in Penang to get uh, universities in Penang to uh, to focus uh, to do, to you know look at their final year pro, uh, uh, projects based on the industry problems rather than uh, uh, you know to 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 have better collaboration between the industry and the academia. And, uh, and we are building this entire ecosystem whether from the early stage uh, uh, in investment into the startups, to the accelerators, to the VCs, and all the way up to uh, getting them uh, mentorship, getting them uh, uh, new markets for them to grow, uh, funding ecosystems, and uh, lastly, uh, trying to uh, work with the federal agencies in terms of big exit. So in a nutshell, uh, uh, basically, digital is something that Penang State Government is, uh, is looking at a big way. We are leveraging on the federal uh, incentives. Federal has the uh, D5 strategy from MTEC. We have the My Digital strategy to create 5,000 startups and all those. So Penang uh, is providing the platform for, for, for companies, whether it's the uh, uh, students who are trying to get into entrepreneurship, students are looking, who are looking into uh, jobs in the uh, uh, digital space, and uh, as well as entrepreneurs to look into opportunities in Pinay. So thank you uh, very much, uh, everyone. Uh, that's my last slide. Thank you very much, Mr. Simavinegan. There's definitely a lot of opportunities for MMU to collaborate with Digital Pinay. 
and Mr. Siva's presentation definitely gives food for thought on the prospects of Penang in particular and Malaysia in general on the digital economy uh, space. We'll now go to the chat box for some questions from the audience leading from Professor Dr. Saravanan and Mr. Siva's presentation earlier. Um, we have a question from uh, Nur Aisha Muyop who asks, ASEAN member states have different level of standard of living and wealth. How can transformation of digitalization be accelerated towards achieving ASEAN economic community by 2025? That was a question. Um, perhaps uh, Mr. Siva would like to take it and Prof. Sarah could add something to it. Uh, Mr. Siva, would you like to turn on your mic, please? Sorry, sorry. Uh, I always forget that. Uh, so, yes, uh, in terms of the uh, standard of living and wealth in the ASEAN space, uh, uh, every uh, country is at different level, right? Uh, and some countries like Singapore is uh, far ahead, ahead in terms of digitalization. That Then comes Malaysia and Vietnam and then the rest of uh, ASEAN. So how, how can uh, there be... Uh, uh, how can we achieve the uh, uh, ASEAN economic community uh, in terms of uh, uh, transformation of digitalization is that how can the countries work together uh, in terms of example if we are attracting a, a digital uh, investment into Malaysia right how can these uh, uh, high value jobs could be you know normally what they do is that the HQs or regional HQs will be based out of Singapore uh, the high value jobs will be based out of Malaysia an example for in, a, in, in the areas of AI, say example, data labeling and stuff, those kind of jobs, uh, which are a bit more manual will be moved to a country like Cambodia and stuff. So this, this, this has been adopted by uh, some of the uh, uh, comp uh, companies, global companies. And, uh, and uh, from a Malaysian uh, perspective, right? Uh, if you see some of the uh, trends that has happened in terms of growth of uh, uh, Malaysian tech companies, they will start from Malaysia. Malaysia is a, one of the best uh, 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 location to start your your uh, digital uh, startups, right? So they start in Malaysia and eventually go to Singapore for their funding, and then uh, move towards the uh, other regions, especially Indonesia and all those for market, right? So this is the kind of dynamics uh, that uh, the entire ASEAN is uh, working together. Uh, over to you, Dr. Professor. Yeah, I mean, yeah, just to add to what uh, Mr. Siva talked about, you know, even Grab had the same fate, you know. Uh, they moved their HQ to Singapore and, and you can see that. But going back to the question on, you know, we are all at um, at different levels of, of our, uh, uh, you know, uh, uh, transformation. And uh, I guess uh, we need to solve what problems are most appealing or, you know, Kind of burning uh, problems right now first right uh, and then move on to more higher level uh, uh, problems and i guess in the space of uh, uh, micro lending and micro payments that's one thing that we all share a common uh, a commonality uh, we, we all need to have access to the banks we all want to start a small business we want to get online we want to start using uh, in ICT to, you know, maybe start a new business, especially uh, when the COVID happened, a lot of people had to reinvent uh, themselves, uh, had from having a nine to five uh, day job, and all of a sudden now you don't have a job, and then you move to, you know, wanting to become an entrepreneur. And uh, there are, of course, barriers to entry, is, which is what we, we have, something called the onboarding uh, uh, program where a lot of these people can get onboarded, uh, and uh, the ecosystem is already there. So it's kind of a plug and play. Uh, it just depends on um, what problems you want to address first. So if you're taking for some, for example, Indonesia, the problems might be different. Here in Malaysia, problems could be different. In Singapore, problems are different. In Brunei, having been a very small country and they have a very high take up rate. They still have issues on, you know, what 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 will work on ICT and what will not work. So we all we all struggling with different problems, and we don't have one formula that can solve everything. I think uh, going back to the uh, ASEAN uh, blueprint, right? Uh, 
It's called the AEC Blueprint 2025. They talk about four very key areas that uh, we all need to work together on. Of course, again, addressing problems of our own, what, what uh, problems we have within our own local context. So number one is highly integrated cohesive economy. Number two is comparative, innovative, dynamic ASEAN. Number three is enhanced connectivity. So again, connectivity is an issue. Uh, and that's something that uh, we need the state, we need you know private sector to all work together. And last thing is uh, having a inclusive, resilient, inclusive, uh, you know, uh, services within that platform. Uh, so I, I, I really think that uh, uh, a lot of these things um, are related to the context of smart city. And we all talk a lot about smart city, uh, but we often don't address the pain points of a smart city. So you take, for example, pollution, it's a pain point. Traffic is a pain point. Congestion is a pain point. Now, how can we use technology to solve some of those pain points? And those pain points may not be similar. Uh, you know, in all our countries are so diverse. So I think if we address that, again, going back to the AEC blueprint 2025, I think uh, we'll be able to address some, some of those questions more holistically. Uh, thank you. Thank you for that question. Uh, over to you, Dr. Ivo. Thank you, Mr. Siva and Prof. Saravanan, for the insightful answers provided. Um, perhaps we'll go to one more question. It's more of a statement, actually, by Karen Pang. Touch and Go is more user-friendly uh, than Boost. So my question is, with so many um, firms and also application apps in the marketplace, uh, what are the prospects in terms of like adoption of these apps? Is diversity the key? Or will it be just one app left standing in it in a digital economy? Like over a fortnight ago, we saw what happens when Facebook had a six hour outage that basically interrupted our lives. So that shows that one app cannot be left standing. But what do you what do both of you think is is the prospect of in the larger uh, digital economy? Uh, perhaps Dr. Sarah could go first. Yes, yeah, okay. Um, so, um, I mean, in my opinion, I think, uh, you know, these um, apps or the, the service providers who actually, uh, you know, promoting their apps need to constantly reinvent themselves. Um, so, for example, uh, you know, you take a layman, right, uh, on the street, and he's downloading an app, and uh, this guy probably needs to pour fuel and... Uh, He's probably, you know, thinking of how to get free fuel, you know, you know, I'm, I'm collecting all these points. What do I actually do with these points? You know, are there any coupons attached to them? Can I get some free fuel? Can I use that to buy some groceries? Uh, maybe walk into the store, you know, the, the, the store in the, in the, uh, you know, the, the, the petrol station and maybe, you know, buy some things inside the store. Uh, so the whole reward system uh, attached to the, the the point system and that attached to that uh, you know that, that the services that the customers use that kind of actually becomes uh, key and and why do we see such an uptake on boost is because they uh, are very very famous for actually addressing some of those uh, check boxes you know like reward is there uh, the people have cash back you have a cash back uh, you know feature to it you have uh, coupons for future purchase, you can redeem them, and, and, and basically probably even moving towards, you know, having to pay no money at all uh, for your future purchases. So I think if we, if we kind of start reinventing and thinking about those things, uh, and not just being an app as an app to fulfill one, you know, just a transaction or, or just, you know, pay for your, your, your tool, I think that doesn't really work. Uh, you know, well, well with our people, I um, mean, the, the consumers today, they are very smart. Um, so they want, they are looking for a reward system. Uh, that's basically it. And, and uh, the reason why Touch and Go kind of has a higher uptake is because they have a uh, huge amount of merchants who are, you know, on board, uh, 100,000 merchants, as I mentioned earlier. And all these merchants, they are actually basically, you know, working with this problem solving uh, uh, issue, how do we actually, uh, you know, make our services richer, how can we you know, introduce better reward systems, and I think that's what will fly uh, for most of these um, uh, application uh, developers 
uh, if they want to survive in the long run. Thank you. Uh, that's just my short answer. Thank you. Over to you, uh, Mr. Siva. Yeah, uh, thank you, uh, Prof. Sarah. So in my view, uh, of course, uh, 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 touch and go to start with itself, uh, it has a, uh, um, how would say, it has the toll plazas, right? So all of us were used to, uh, we was forced to use touch and go in the past. And eventually they, they moved towards the apps and all the stuff and they had their foreign uh, funding also, right? Which uh, basically uh, uh, made their app a, a lot more powerful. They are cash rich. Uh, they, are, they have better interoperability and also marketing funds and other stuff compared to even though Boost is also owned by a, a large group, but then uh, uh, Touch and Go had the uh, early start and better foundation to start, start with. But uh, from a, uh, from a uh, uh, in my view, from a government perspective, also you can't force uh, startups. Uh, you know, we, we, we encourage as many startups as possible. But uh, eventually, uh, the market economy will also force them to merge or the bigger boys to buy over the, the smaller guys. That's basically the, the game which is played on the startup side, right? Even when you have two giants like Grab and Uber, they decide to uh, consolidate their, their base, consolidate their funding and have one big presence, which is not good for the entire ASEAN. But that's how things are happening. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Siva and Prof. Sarah, for, these, for those answers. Um, I think that we are actually run out of time. So we are near the end of this webinar. As a, as a closing remark, so thank you very much to both of our very, very knowledgeable speakers for enlightening us about the future prospects of digital economy in ASEAN, in Malaysia, as well as in Penang. Uh, digital ASEAN, Penang and Malaysia is the reality is the now. It is up to the industry, I guess, um, the researchers in the industry and the higher education institutions, as what was mentioned by the two speakers, businesses, large and small as well, to either accept these challenges and opportunities that the digital economy offers or become a footnote of Malaysia and ASEAN's climb to be a technologically proficient and technology-centric nation. Um, before I end this webinar, I would like to thank uh, Professor Dr. Saravanan and also Mr. Siva uh for being the guest speakers for today's webinar on humanizing innovation at MMU. Dr. Anusia Subarao, Head of the Industry and Academia Collaboration, who is also the organizer of this webinar from the Center of Excellence in Knowledge and Innovation and Management, and also the Industrial Collaborations and Engagement Center, ICEC, and the Research Industrial Collaboration and Engagement, RICE Division of MMU, the Strategic Marketing, the MMU Studios, and the Technical Support Team for the smooth running of this webinar. And of course, to you, the audience, for your attention and insightful questions asked today. To everyone, take care and stay safe and have a great rest of the day. Thank you. Thank you.